welcome everyone. Um, as, as all of you know, yesterday was a very uh, historic day, I should say. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. 60, more than 60 papers on, on the archive on one, about one event. Uh, before it was announced, all of these papers were written. Turns out one of them had uh, almost 4,000 authors. And when I spoke with the LA Times uh, reporter, she said that and you are not one of the people that... <laughs> and I said, well, thinking about it, uh, 4,000 people is roughly all the observers in astronomy worldwide. Uh, so it must be that I'm a theorist. That's why I'm not on it, uh, on any of the teams. And um, ob obviously, the next few weeks will be um, the revenge of the theorist, because now we will try to interpret this huge amount of data that the observers uh, accumulated over the past uh, few months. And, it's quite remarkable, like, for example, this event produced 100 times the mass of the Earth in Gorg. <coughs> so Forbes magazine calculated how much it's worth. <laughs> 10 to the power of 28 dollars. This, is the, way, this is the way to get uh, Trump's attention. Just <laughs> uh, 10 to the power of 28 dollars in one astronomical event. Um, aside from producing gold and platinum and silver, so now we know where they come from. Uh, uh, aside from that, um, it, it was a, a way of, for example, inferring the Hubble constant to 10%. Uh, quite remarkable from one event. <coughs> you have to realize the people that they use supernovae use a hundred of other hundred events to get to that level of precision. Uh, how can you do it with one event? Because you have a distance measurement from LIGO. It depends, of course, on the orientation, which we don't know, the binary neutron star, but, but uh, since the binary neutron star was monitored for um, half a minute or a minute, there, there were many, many hundreds of orbits where you see the in spirals, so that you can calibrate the distance quite, quite well to within 10%. Um, and then you measure the redshift of the host galaxy. And that is uncertain because there could be a peculiar velocity. At the distance of 40 megaparsec, the Hubble expansion speed is about 3,000 kilometers per second. So, peculiar velocities could be 10% of that. So, basically, the 10% precision in the Hubble constant, which is only a factor of a few worse than the best we can do with other techniques, um, is, is remarkable with one event. And it means that uh, as we get more of those events, eventually we'll pin down cosmology much better than in traditional ways. So that's uh, an example. Uh, another thing is uh, probing matter at very extreme density and temperature that we can do with such events. So in difference from pulsars that have uh, nuclear matter at extreme density, um, here you also get extreme temperature because you have two neutron stars colliding. They heat up to 50 MeV or so, and so that allows you to probe nuclear matter equation of state at the nuclear density and high temperatures. Something that we, I mean, in principle, the QCD Lagrangian should give it to us, but people don't know how to solve it at, uh, uh, numerically in a reasonable time. Uh, and so we don't know how what's the equation of state at those temperatures and densities. And that's another thing. And of course, ultimately, the question is, did we make a, a black hole or a neutron star in this event? And uh, we might not know, actually, because uh, there is not enough data on this one to tell. Um, that the answer to this question depends on whether the, how much spin there is to the final object and on the equation of state of nuclear matter. So, uh, again, more work for the future on other events. The amazing thing is that this event was observed in gamma rays 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave. So the fact that gamma rays were observed 1.7 seconds after is reassuring. <coughs> because if it was before, uh, well, you could have done it if there was a very powerful magnetic field to each of the neutron stars. You could get a burst of radiation. But um, it ca came afterwards. And the afterwards, the 1.7 seconds, can be used to set limits on the deviation of the speed of light from the speed of the gravitational waves, uh, 10 to the minus 15 or so. And on alternative theories of gravity that violate the equivalence 
principle of violet Lorentz invariance. Um, but it also tells you something about why, um, you know, if you assume that they propagate exactly at the same speed, then the, the 1.7 seconds relates to the time it takes perhaps the jet that emits the, the gamma rays uh, to penetrate through the uh, material so that you can see it. Or it tells you something about the Lorentz factor of the jet. Uh, astrophysical issues that people will no doubt uh, model in the coming. So I, I'm actually curious to see how many papers will be written today or not posted today on astrophysics because those are the 60 that we've seen yesterday were all written in confidence, you know, in, in secrecy and people didn't know about each other's uh, uh, and today we will see papers that were written after the data came out. So it's quite I've never seen anything like it. First of all, astrophysics is now entering the particle physics regime. There are about 4,000 people on, on a paper. That's it. I mean, the Higgs boson paper was 5,000. It might be of the same magnitude. Um, and second, it's a very collaborative effort that uh, across many telescopes, many uh, observatories, people collaborate. So that's a wonderful experience to see people working together um, in, in, in our community. So I should, in closing, just say that uh, when I was a postdoc, um, the senior people at uh, Princeton used to argue that uh, LIGO will not be worth the investment of funds, uh, that it's an exception not to put money into it. Um, there is no way it will be helpful to astronomy. and. And this just shows you um, how people are short-sighted very often. And it's quite remarkable that NSF was persistent at funding it at the level of uh, up to a billion dollars. And then a couple of years ago, I was at the winter school, and uh, I decided to give a talk about gravitational wave astrophysics uh, to the young students. And uh, actually, a junior faculty from uh, university came to me and said, why are you, actually he publicly said, why are you wasting the time of the young people uh, on a subject like that? Uh, we all know that, you know, it will never be useful to astronomy. This was a couple of years ago. I will not mention the name of the astronomer. He is uh, in his 30s, very young person, much younger than I am, but conservative. And uh, I mention it just because many of you will see conservative feedback on works that you do over the years. And you should be smart enough to ignore it. <laughs> because the breakthroughs and the discoveries uh, are originated. And when you throw that onto a platform. So we have this uh, standard model, as you're probably very well aware. You have a central black hole, which basically tells you the maximum power up which you can get. You have the accretion disk around it, conservation of angular momentum, that sets the typical temperature, basically. And there's a relativistic jet accelerated by unknown means. Uh, there are too many theories for, like, for how that happens. But the, once you have it, then the special relativistic effects explain all sorts of good things like supernova expansion. Right? This is um, actually a pretty bad theory. Uh, it explains what it explains. It explains what is invented to explain, but it doesn't predict any of those other uh, regions around the black hole that emit all those atomic features. It doesn't explain the variety of quasars that we see. So it's, it's in the ideal uh, scientific model, you would hope it would predict things that you haven't yet seen and you would then go and verify them. I don't believe it's actually <coughs> done that. So what our problem is, is quasars emit across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So that's from the infrared through the X-rays and the radio on the far left. Uh, some minority of quasars are radio loud, they have those jets, most don't. Uh, each of these regions, each of these regions of the spectrum refers to physically different regions of the uh, object in, in the interior. So the X-ray refers to a corona, and a corona means the region that the region that emits X-rays because we don't know what it is. Uh, and the accretion disk dominates in the ultraviolet and then dust at uh, various temperatures in the infrared and the jet. It's sort of, a, sort of an odd puzzle, which I won't try to answer, but the horizontal line in this space, which is mu f nu versus nu in log, is equal power per decade, the logarithmic interval, 
and it's relatively constant across that whole spectrum, that whole electromagnetic spectrum, compared with other objects like galaxies or even blazars uh, and stars. So why that is, I do not know. And it continues to uh, and, Well, we don't know. This is a radio quiet spectrum. If you plug the blazars, they have these two heat humps, right? And the contrast between the minimum and the peak <coughs> is several layers. So it's much more varied than this. Uh, we don't know where this cuts off. It can't go above, what, uh, where is he? Uh, two or 300 keV, because then you violate the X-ray background. So on average, it doesn't go very far. But it might go far enough to be energetically significant. And we just, I think, just don't know that yet. OK. So the big, to answer your question, you can put the scale <laughs> on uh, distance from the black hole log in log of uh, Schwarzschild radii. And the black hole's sphere of influence, where the galaxy uh, gravity becomes negligible compared with the black hole, is somewhere around a million, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, Schwarzschild radii. So outside that, the history of the galaxy matters. And inside that, the history of the galaxy is erased, because you're, everything is dominated by that potential. Except, of course, for the uh, me metallicity, the amount of heavy elements coming in. Well, that, can be, that depends on galaxy history. So, in detail, that matters, but not for this point. Unless they are produced by stars locally. Also true. Uh, quasars, incidentally, have, turn out to have very high metallicities, uh, at least factors of two or three above solar, and at high redshifts, apparently about an order of magnitude higher than solar. So they're definitely formed in interestingly strange environments. Well, well then how come some black holes have jets and others don't? We don't know. But that contradicts what you just said? No, it doesn't. Why not? It, because the, the, well, because it, we certainly know that the jet originates very, very close in. So whatever mechanism turns that on and off has to be uh, very set very close in. Okay, it guess. could be that the spin of the black hole matters, as Abby just mentioned, right? And that could be due to a merger event on a, on a hundred million year time scale or something. So it could have had a recent merger which span up the black hole and turned on the jet. In that sense, yes. But it all, but it, but the detail. What matters to the Jet is the angular momentum that's given to the black hole, and that's a local effect. It doesn't matter how it got that angular momentum. That's what I mean. So, well, you're suggesting that all AGN <coughs> just depend on the mass and the spin of the black hole that sits in the middle. And of the them. accretion rate. And the accretion rate. Yes. But you just added another thing. There might have been a recent merger. Well, because that would give. So that I should put angular momentum on there. <coughs> spin is angular. Momentum. But, I, but it's coming in from, the, from externally, is what you're saying. You mean how much? Right. Some flux at the boundary. Well, some angular momentum, momentum the flux at the boundary. The accretion rate isn't just a mass accretion rate, right. it's also the angular momentum. Angular momentum, momentum flux at, at the which boundary. Which is a nice yeah. point. I like yeah. that. Yes. <coughs> yes? And what about the coronas? Those are also determined by. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. He wants the whole talk instantly. <laughs> you, you obviously have a, a very high data rate. Uh, OK, we know where the different components that I sh showed you in the spectral energy distribution come from, starting with radio and X-ray close in, UV, optical, and then some of the um, emission line, the atomic features coming further out, and then the dust, and then other features out here. And so we know that in this region, all the things should be very simple. They should be very tightly related to one another. And maybe the broad emission lines that dominated that spectrum I showed you come from there, and perhaps that's not so surprising then that they scale fairly robustly with all those other parameters, redshift, uh, Eddington rate, and so on. So we put those, those red regions circled there are the red regions in the spectrum here. <coughs> and as you go out, things tend to get cooler and go lower in frequency. So let's go through this the inside out. I'm not going to talk about the coolest dust, so the emission at tens of microns is not interesting to us, beyond, say, 20 microns. And I look, tend to give an eccentric viewpoint, not only because I've worked for the, in X-ray astronomy for many years, but because it's the band that is least affected by uh, emission from the host <coughs> galaxy and least affected by, the, by obscuration by dust and gas. So to start with, this is a very well-known relation. Uh, the so-called black hole fundamental plane. It's really a relation that tells you that the radio to X-ray ratio depends on the black hole mass. Uh, it's only for radio loud objects, however. 
So this connection is very tight, this tells you, and it's dependent on the mass, but it doesn't, uh, it's only for radio loud objects. So we need to do this. Is this a similar thing for radio quiet objects? We don't know. I learned recently that there's a study that's perfect for solving this that's being undertaken right now, so we'll probably know this in a couple of years. So for now, uh, I'm not going to make any strong claims <coughs> about the radio emission. But if we go straight to the x-rays now, this is our starting for a baseline thing here, the um, spectral slope of the, of the, the X-ray spectra of quasars tends to be just a power law uh, to a first order. It's very complicated to second order, but the first order is just a power law with a, with a spectral slope gamma in photon index. It's a rare. And some years ago, uh, my student Monica Young and Guido Rizzoliti uh, uh, looked at the XMM archive and found a uh, great relation where the X-ray, oops, where the slope depended on the Eddington ratio. And you need to stretch to very high and very low ratios, near to one and near to 1%. So that's about the full range where we expect normal accretion disks to work, to see this. Uh, but it was uh, a nonlinear relation. But it would be. So it went to the 0.6 power of the <coughs> Eddington ratio. This is going to be revisited more recently by Murray Brightman in uh, 2013. And he and his colleagues uh, looked more carefully than we did, I think, because they looked carefully at whether it was a black hole mass dependence or an Eddington rate dependence. And they also looked at the two numbers from which those two are derived to see if there was some, Edding, some uh, uh, you're really just plotting one thing against itself or something like that. And the answer was, no, it's certainly not black hole mass. And there is a relationship with Eddington ratio. They got a different uh, coefficient here. So it's, it's still pretty sloppy because these are averages over many <coughs> poor measurements. Well, the Eddington limit is very close to equal to two dividing two, which yes. is the equal amount of energy per lobe per day. Yes, Frequency. correct. Yeah. Yes. That, that might be very meaningful. Yeah, no because idea. you showed this line. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, that, that now we should replace that SED with one that depends on Eddington rate, and you'll see that in the upper <laughs> part. Um, right. Uh, these error bars individually are very large with the New Star telescope, which uh, Islav has worked on extensively. Uh, it has a very long focal length, that means you can use narrow grazing angles, and that means you can reflect X rays up to nearly 100 keV, 79 keV. And uh, it can measure the individual measurements here, it can be made very small, very accurate, uh, very precise anyway. Uh, from the, uh, five times smaller error bars individually. So I think if we assemble a sample with wide range of Eddington ratio based on this new star satellite measurements, we'll be able to pin that down much, much better. But uh, we also should say before we leave the X-rays on their own, the X-ray spectra to first order are a power law, to second order we have at least two other features. There's a soft excess emerging well below a kilovolt, and uh, which Chris Doan has uh, shown as pretty constant in its behavior, and I haven't added that into the talk yet. And then New Star is beginning to measure the high energy cutoff, which is basically the temperature of the electrons that are doing this scattering, we believe, to make the upscatter the photons into x rays. Um, those are very poorly measured right now. And we really need a successful satellite to New Star to do it better. So I'm not going to try and go there, but just for completeness. <clears throat> now let's look at the from the X-rays, looked at the ratio to the ultraviolet. This is a very interesting one. It's been uh, well known for a long time. The scatter on the roof was clearly a trend. It's been known since, in fact, Einstein Observatory in 1979, 1980, something like that. But it's been useless because <coughs> it's got this huge scatter. If anyone went to Guido Rizzoliti's CFA colloquium a couple of weeks ago, you'll have seen that that is now much, much better. If you select the right quasars, the ones that minimize reddening and host galaxy con contribution, then the scatter is instantly reduced to 0.3 dex. And so that becomes a very tight relationship. And in fact, as he probably said at his talk, but I haven't heard, his latest data shows that actually that's, a lot of that scatter is still instrumental. And when they do a, a more careful, point targeted look at these quasars, they get down to 0.15 dex. And so that's very exciting for uh, cosmology, because you can now measure the metric using quasars from redshift 1 to 6, which is totally, essentially inaccessible to supernovae uh, measurements. And 
for the moment, at least, a gravitational wave. So that, they'll work on that, I'm sure. Uh, so the corona, the thing that emits x-rays, used to be, uh, I actually get quite a lot of surprise when I tell people we don't know what it is. Uh, it's just the thing that emits x-rays. It, it, when, it, when there was that huge scatter, you said, well, there's an accretion disk, we sort of understand that, and then somehow you sprinkle a, arbitrary amounts of x-rays on clock. And that's just not true. Given this tiny scatter, it's highly predictable. If you know the accretion disk luminosity, then you know how, what the x-ray luminosity is going to be to within 50%. <coughs> so it's no longer arbitrary. Uh, now, the caveat, which I'll get to again in the next case, if we selected the bluest objects, maybe we're deliberately throwing away all the interesting variety in the quasar spectrum. So let me get to that later. Uh, I think it's telling us something very important that it's a nonlinear effect, however. You're not just turning up the volume on the entire quasar, you're changing the ratios. And so some, there's some interesting physics that we do not understand there yet. Ah, okay. My question. Hello again. Uh, maybe it's not a future question, but <laughs> something I said. My understanding was that, that in the Novikov thorn accretion disk model, as well as, well as the, its modification by um, Narayan and Penna for the spinning ones, that, that the, the, the rate of accretion was determined by the spin of the black hole by a boundary condition uh, near the ISCO. Well, the, the highest yes. temperature you can reach is, uh, is determined by that because you have a smaller ISCO. But in your, in your the accretion rate. Because Not in those models. Is, is what you feed the system. Mm -hmm. It's not what happens in the instant. Yeah, I mean, it's a boundary. So, so, in I'm particular, in the Penna, just... in the Penna, Narayan model, the accretion rate goes to zero at extra well, That's, ah. that's what, so time, times is... times an arbitrary constant f. Are you saying that that constant f is determined by the environment of it's the nomenclature? You're, you're referring to the mm -hmm. amount of gas that gets into the black hole. Yeah. That's not what uh, no. Martin cares about the, the gas that in the disk that emits. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't matter if it goes into the black hole or gets expelled in a wind afterwards. Correct. So what parameter determines that? That's also determined by the black hole itself. No, that's determined by the external supply of by the gas external from large supply. radii, so I beyond think. ten to the six forty two radii. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, but, but, but Martin, but it also depends on the mode of accretion, right? I mean, right, it, and I mean, all of the quasars, and essentially all quasars, the things that we see lit up brightly, are all within a, the range one percent to one hundred percent of Eddington. Ah, uh, I see. So you're, right. not, you're not. There are plenty of black holes that are way below that, but we don't see them lighting up and showing the same phenomenology as quasars. I, I see. Right. And there are all, essentially none above that that we can find. Okay, and is there not an orientation? Part of there will system. also be orientation, and I think Guido in his talk, uh, colloquium, may have talked about how he thinks he can reduce the scatter on that below 0.1 pi by taking into account the orientation using the oxygen 3 uh, equivalent width. Mm -hmm. He wrote a paper on this several years ago. Very cute. So 15% you know, is an upper limit to the physical uh, scatter. Orientation should take some of that out, and the fact that we uh, observing non-simultaneously or not in the right uh, with, with the two x-ray and, and UV measurements uh, also add scatter so uh, the true physics uh, scatter could be essentially zero it's getting very very small okay uh, we have to worry about well, I'm going to move now to the uh, optical band and the near infrared 1 to 3 microns and 0.3 to 1 microns so that's this region in the spectral range distribution. And uh, some first thing to note is that because there is a mass of the bulge, mass of the black hole relationship, the, it turns out the numbers come out, the, the, the uh, luminosity of the uh, host galaxy at around one to two microns is never negligible, right? Because the Eddington limit says the maximum amount of power you can get out from the accretion uh, <coughs> disk spectrum for that. And the M stars, the mass and the bulge, has a fixed mass to light ratio, essentially. And so there's a minimum contribution in the 1 to 2 micron band where the M stars peak, and it's tens of percent. 
So uh, you always have to worry about the host galaxy contribution when you're looking at this band, I think. And also the age of the host galaxy population matters. Uh, this is in particular work basically by uh, my former student, Hung Hao. And uh, she was looking at different templates. She's normalized the quasar here and the host galaxy to be equal at <coughs> one micron. And then you see different ages of populations in the stellar population. And as you go younger and younger, you get more UV and you get more infrared emission. So you have to worry about the age of the population too. So she made this diagram, uh, which is very, I think, useful. Um, called a mixing diagram, uh, based on something by uh, Alan Sandage in the 1960s as a concept, but she we refined it greatly. <coughs> and what you see here is that spectral energy distribution I showed you uh, has a particular slope in the optical and in the UV. This is the optical slope, that's the, sorry, this is the optical slope and the infrared slope, particular slope in the infrared. And you can plot one against the other. <coughs> and very conveniently, that's where my mean template lies, and that was the range we saw. If you add dust reddening, things move down in this direction. If you add in various amounts of host galaxy starlight, they move up in this direction. So it's 10%, 60%, 90% host galaxy. And of course, the line you move along depends on the age of that uh, stellar population. So very young stars are up here, stellar populations are here, one giga year, ten giga years. So these are drawn to a few giga year old populations, just for illustration. That's very nice because these two are perpendicular, more or less, and so it's easy to separate their effects. So if you were able to remove Hope's galaxy, you move in that direction of the blue arrow, and if you move reddening, you move in that direction for the uh, sort of, yeah, ugly color. Okay, so this is what the actual data looked like when we put down the uh, particular sample of quasars she was looking at. It also works for other samples of quasars. But basically, you see they do, in fact, spread out from roughly where that mean template was of mine out in the direction of an old stellar population. And so it's very suggestive that we're looking, and there's a little bit of spread down in the reddening direction, but not much in this case. So that's <coughs> my old template. Uh, there's a sort of throwaway line here that most quasars lie in old galaxies, and they're selected this way at least, and very few lie in starburst galaxies. We should have made a lot more fuss about that because there's been a lot of debate about that question, uh, but that's, that's more of the astrophysics, and we don't really care about that too much. Uh, there's more evidence that that's uh, the correct interpretation, that we're looking at a mixing diagram, mi mixed between host galaxy and a single quasar template. Uh, the case where you would expect the least contamination by the host galaxy is where you're at near the Eddington limit. So that's where the quasar is brightest compared to the host galaxy. So we selected out the ones within uh, one four dex. And you see they move down in this direction. They're no longer spread out all that way. So it looks to me like we really are dealing with something that's, uh, that's another sample that shows a similar thing. So these two pieces of the spectrum, when you remove the reddening and you remove the host galaxy, are basically <coughs> invariant. And su suggestively so, uh, this is the limit of the Shakura Sinai uh, alpha disk, the slope of 0.3 in F1.3 in this, these units. Uh, it's like you're getting asymptotically close to that simple solution. Uh, you could imagine using this diagram for other things, as Hung Hao actually suggested herself. We won't go into that. There's also suggestions that we are looking at an accretion disk because you can pick out the objects where you'd expect to see the accretion disk start to turn over, and very quickly, that's what we see uh, when we do that. So it's quite interesting that this is these were picked to, because they would show this turn down if that were the correct theory, and they didn't show a turn down. I haven't seen the com perfect comparison with the um, Shukai Shukura Sunyaev predictions. Uh, exactly, but I, I would intend to harass the authors to find that out. So probably those accretion disk models are actually relevant. So uh, lastly, we can say, well, what's the most, the longest wavelength emission where we ought to see this simplicity? And the answer comes out to be 
uh, around 20 microns emission because that's the temperature of the dust you would get near to the atmospheric sphere influence uh, if you were radiated with a central continuum source that looks like a quasar. And in fact, here's a nice correlation with six microns and slightly less good one at 12 microns, so we're getting pretty close. This one is actually, uh, we can do much better. That was with a very big beam. That's this. You see a deviation when you get below a, that luminosity. But when you lose a small beam with a VLT, that you can actually continue this relation down a couple of, a couple of decades lower down. So it's actually a very tight correlation. It's a linear relation between the X-ray and the infrared, uh, thermal infrared. That's very strange, actually. But nevertheless, it tells us there's a very tight connection. So everything is indeed behaving properly, except that. So the reason you get that better agreement with small beams is because you're not contaminated by massive stars. We assume so. So you get a 100 parsec roughly beam with the VLT. I think they've underplayed that too, uh, as one tends to sometimes. That means there's no star formation in the actual central region, which is quite an interesting surprise, because some people have talked about that at length. But that's more astrophysics again. Uh, I don't understand why the X-rays and the mid-infrared, coming one coming from a few Schwarzschild radii, one coming from a few hundred thousand Schwarzschild radii, should be have the same nonlinear relation with the primary accretion disk emission. So that, to me, is a puzzle. And of course, we'd like to. We've only seen where it works. This ought to fall apart when you get to 50 microns or 70 microns or something, because then the other processes should be coming in, and the, the, the uh, quasar and black hole is no longer dominating. That needs to be tested. We don't have a small beam measurement to make. So we've looked at all those different regions, and they are all simple. So we probably only have to look at those accretion rates, uh, those four parameters, plus where m dot is considered to include accretion of angular momentum. So we can quickly look at this and see what happens to this horrible thing. Much of this complex uh, terminology can be explained by host contamination, a lot more by reddening, a lot more because we have jets, which I'm not going to touch on. And uh, the details of the atomic features are almost all explained by having a wind coming off the accretion disk. Another thing I could go into at a separate time, but it's much more astrophysics. And the interesting ones are the purple ones there, because they seem to be dependent on the accretion rate, which is an actually interesting physical variable. So it's a way of honing in on the things that are actually more interesting to study. So uh, we're looking, I'll just summarize what I've said. We have just a few relations that define uh, the entire continuum for quasars. And they're pretty much, we know what they depend on, or have some good idea what the physics is behind it. Um, but we haven't quite put it all together yet. Uh, so for instance, we, but we must be close to a solution. This is all, we can summarize the whole thing in one, in one set of little equations, very simple equations. Uh, why there is this nonlinear relation between the UV and X-ray? Uh, again, uh, Lusso and Rizaliti have a paper discussing this in terms of the radius at which um, um, radiation pressure begins to dominate in the disk, and they find that this uh, index comes out uh, naturally, but it does imply a very large X-ray source, which is a little uh, confusing because it comes out. <coughs> and I have no idea, as I said, why the infrared and the X-rays have the same dependency on nonlinear dependency on the angle. So I'll just stop and tell her with the fact that you can ignore almost all of that complexity. Those equations are basically pretty much all you need now. Uh, or you want, or someone here can tell me what the physics is behind it, because it can't be that hard, right? Uh, you're only allowed to use those variables, and it's your job, uh, because I'm going off to mine the asteroids. So, <laughs> thank you. So, a single black hole is simple, but two black holes is relatively, uh, uh, arguably, less simple. Yes. And we do think that there probably should be two black holes. Centers of some galaxies. Too. Some. Some. I guess the name of the thing is we don't know. How well, often that so happens. that's a very interesting uh, state, and there are many more double black holes than anyone would have guessed a few years ago. 
then uh, fewer being found. The separations tend to be on the kiloparsec scale or maybe 100 parsec scale. So they are still independent objects. They're not uh, interacting in, with, uh, with relativity in a strong way. Uh, yes, so how many there really are at smaller separations is uh, hard to find out. People have looked for double emission lines, so like where you can, in principle, see very small separations. Unfortunately, double emission lines also come from biconical outflows, which are extremely common, in fact, perhaps universal in uh, quasars and active galaxies. So it's hard to know just how many we have on that time scale. Lisa, we have. Of course, and I'll let you wait for that. I'm going to do something else. Okay, I think we should move on. Let's thank Martin again. So our second speaker is uh, Victor Govenko. He obtains PhD in New York University in physics, and he's now a postdoc in Stanford. He's been working on the effects of uh, string theory, QCD, among other topics. And today he will tell us about uh, new physics in black hole. Uh, yeah, thanks for this introduction. I see if so, yeah, this works. So, Oh, is there actually a pointer in this thing? It's not gonna... Yeah, but it doesn't work. No, it doesn't. It won't appear on the yeah. screen. Okay. Very well. yeah. That's okay. Yeah. So I changed my title a little bit yesterday. I added these two letters. Oh, wow. Great. Thank you. Uh, I added these two letters to it um, for obvious reasons. Uh, and actually, when I was thinking about this project, we were mostly had black holes in mind, but you will see that in principle it's conceptual and I think it's general enough, so uh, it can also be applied to neutron star mergers, and so I think this title is honest. Okay, uh, so this started about a year and a half ago uh, when we all first saw these pictures. This is a snapshot from the first LIGA discovery paper. Uh, and of course we're all excited. I think everybody in the physics community was excited. It's a, it's a great achievement of the humankind. Um, it is a confirmation of wonderful prediction of Einstein's of about 100 years ago. And of course, astrophysics wise, we will learn a huge amount of uh, new information about our universe. Okay? But uh, as, as, as theorists, uh, we were of course wondering, can we learn something about uh, fundamental physics. And again, I'm not trying to say here that astrophysics is not a fundamental important discipline, right? But by, by fundamental theories, I simply mean something that is uh, that does not follow even in complicated way from standard model and general relativity. Okay? And, uh, and of course, th th there are proposals, and I think most interesting of those proposals, they are related to some uh, statistics of uh, statistical measurements that will come about because I think uh, uh, now, now we're sure that we'll see lots of those events uh, unless we were incredibly likely for the year and a half and it was statistical fluctuation but that's, that's not likely. So we'll see lots of black holes and uh, if, if the mass spectrum of uh, black holes looks in some funny way it can point to something to some interesting inflationary theories for example and if, if the distribution of spins of black holes uh, has some features, then actually this way we can discover some light bosonic particles with, with the black holes, with this effect called super radiance. Um, uh, and there are, there are other things. Uh, for example, uh, if, we have, if we have neutron stars and we have an electromagnetic counterpart, uh, there can be some new effects. And, and I, I, I didn't obviously have a chance to 
think much about those 60 papers that appeared since yesterday, but my eye also picked this, uh, this thing that, 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 that mentioned earlier today. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, this four lines are taken from the joint Liga, uh, Fermi, uh, an integral paper. It is about this, uh, so, the, so the claim is that they're putting the strongest bound on this gamma parameter, and this gamma parameter is uh, basically a Shapira time delay for gravitational waves and for uh, electromagnetic waves uh, that they experience when they travel uh, from the merger to us. Uh, and, and they claim that this, uh, so the bound on the difference of Shapiro time delay for gravitational waves uh, and photons, uh, the, the strongest limit was uh, by Cassini satellite, and they claim to beat it, which, which is remarkable. Um, but uh, I, I tried to, so this is just some phenomenological parameter, okay? Um, Shapiro time delay, and put a coefficient in front of it and call it gamma. Uh, and I try to think a little bit about a theory that will give different Shapiro time delay for gravitational waves and for uh, for photons. And uh, okay, I didn't think much, but uh, I couldn't really come up with anything that would make sense and that would do. Okay, so so when I talk about uh, uh, about new theories. Uh, I have something more ambitious. I, I really want a theory that I, as I'm sure that, uh, to some extent makes sense, okay? And, and that can be tested with, uh, with gravitational wave observatories. And it, it, it is natural, of course, to try to, to test uh, gravity itself, okay? Uh, because this is the first time we encounter such strong gravitational fields. Uh, and there is a, um, there is a falling intuition that that shouldn't be possible. Okay, uh, you can be pessimistic because some characteristic energy scales that are present during this collision are about a kilometer. Okay, well we have tested gravity with great precision all the way to to a micron, almost. Uh, so, so you may see that okay, you will a new physics usually comes with like new energy scales. Okay, so you may not exactly share this intuition, but, but this is actually intuition I've heard from, uh, from, from, from many particle physicists. There is no hope that we will see something new, unfortunately. Uh, but I will show you that, that this is a little bit too naive, this observation. Okay, so uh, we may be uh, more likely. Uh, okay, good. So gravity is something mysterious in principle, so we don't want to be too conservative so that we miss some interesting opportunity and don't go and look for it, okay? But uh, on the other hand, uh, we want to be conservative enough so that we have a theory that is uh, self-consistent, okay? Uh, that, that I can actually call it there. And uh, so, so we listed for ourselves this uh, four requirements. Well, the first one is that the, the theory is calculable. It's more or less a tautology it's if, if the theory doesn't allow to uh, calculate anything, it's not really a theory. Uh, then the second one is that this, oops, sorry, I'm just showing the screen. Uh, the, the second one is that this should preserve uh, some uh, uh, very general properties of, uh, of uh, physical theory, that is locality, uh, causality, and unitarity, which is again, basically, if you violate one of them, but we can, we can talk in more, what is a more detailed definition of locality and causality, but you need to have it in some sense uh, just to, uh, to be able to talk uh, in value theory on a rigorous terms. Uh, and then, okay, well, so those are two very general things. But more specifically, we want it to be testable with gravitational wave observatories, okay? So that we wanted this theory to actually predict some sizable corrections uh, that LIGA can measure, right? because it is a precise instrument, but it's not an infinitely precise instrument. Uh, and we want it to be not in conflict with, uh, with any experiments known today, okay? And uh, for this, uh, uh, so high energy physicists, uh, we have the very general framework that is suitable for tasks like this, where you kind of do not know anything about your theory, but you want to be uh, consistent with some general principles. So this is called uh, the framework of uh, effective field theory. Uh, and this is a statement that, that if you want to have a theory that is valid 
at some range of energy scales, okay? That's very important that there is some finite, finite range of energy scales where this theory should be applicable. Um, then uh, any, any physical phenomena can be parameterized with an action that consists, uh, that is built out of uh, local fields, okay? And then if we're asking some physical questions with some, we're only interested in the answers uh, with some given order of precision, then there's always just a finite number of parameters that, that parameterizes any physical observable, okay? Uh, and, and, well, pretty much anything we know uh, exists, uh, there are effective field theories for it, okay? There are now effective field theories for non-fermi liquids, there are effective field theories for large-scale structure formations, so, uh, th these things work. And especially in, the, in this, in the case at hand, in the case we're trying to modify theory that was initially weakly coupled, and which has, uh, uh, which is general relativity, uh, I mean, it's, at least it's weakly coupled far away from the, okay, let's call this, but it, it's really hard to imagine how, uh, how the modification to be not Modification that is not describable by effective field. Okay, so the, the, the important part for, for building this effective field theory uh, is to specify a set of your uh, local fields. Uh, and since we're doing gravity, there is a necessary local field which is the metric field, okay, of the graviton, but we're doing all classical, so just the metric. Uh, you could add other fields. But this, is be, this will be, in a sense, less minimum. It will get all the complications that I will get, but on top of this, we'll be adding new degrees of freedom. So uh, it is straightforward to do so, but, uh, uh, but for this talk, we will, uh, we will assume that metric is our uh, only field. Okay, and this immediately tells us that we should be building our action because we want to have the homomorphism invariant uh, of the Uh, we want to build it out of the Riemann tensor uh, and of its derivatives. Okay. Very good. So let me let me be slightly so sort of words so for the first formula for this talk. Um, so we want to start the action. So this is R. This is Einstein Hilbert action, of course, right? This is uh, something everybody should know. And then I have the uh, m Planck squared in front of it. Uh, I can start just writing some random operators built out of uh, contractions of the Riemann tensor, okay? Uh, and they will be suppressed by some energy scale because of high derivative operators. Uh, and, and in order for it to be able to give sizable corrections to Liger events, the scale should be sum of order of the uh, Schwarzschild radius inverse, right? But, Whatever. But yes. Based on physics, we'd expect it a Planck scale. Uh, no, this is. I don't think it is true. You see, the reason we have uh, the reason uh, we have a Planck scale in general relativity is because we only have actually one operator there. Okay, it's a complicated action, but but in my classification, it's one operator. It doesn't it only has one coupling constant, right? Uh, in principle, there can be other effects suppressed by arbitrary energy scales. It is like I mean, in standard model, uh, that's the simplest example, right? There is electroweak scale. Scale, but it doesn't mean that there is right, no so other the standard theory. model with the electroweak scale, right? We had to build the LHC to see this. Yes. You're proposing here the, the proposal the black the laws hole, of the, the black laws of physics collapse. that scales far, far lower. Yes. A yes. thousand orders of Many magnitude of orders of lower than what we have at the LHC. But I mean, why wouldn't we have seen it at the LHC? I could, yeah, that's a very good point. And but, uh, but even before that, yes. this, this action has to do with gravity. Yes. It's not with a black hole. Black hole is one realization of this absolutely, action. Absolutely. So absolutely. how can you put a, a Schwarzschild radius into an action? No, 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 sorry. I'm not putting Schwarzschild radius into action. Yeah, this is, uh, sorry, that was not clear. I'm putting some arbitrary parameter, and I'm saying, okay, we have to be agnostic about what this parameter can be. Can be a you know, string scale, can be anything. We should. Uh, we just. The the philosophy. The philosophical part of this talk is the following. Okay, we have a great experiment. We should ask: Can we measure anything new uh, related to gravity with this experiment? And the only thing is that theoretical self consistency. Why would this affect the Shapiro time delay? Right. It's the scale. Yeah. It's the scale of a black hole. We've done. We've done. We've, yeah, astro yeah. Astronomical. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll talk about that, just give me, uh, you're, 
for the previous talk, you also want to, <laughs> to see everything in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, no, and of, of course, this is a very important point, right? Uh, Are there two different uh, parameters, lambda 1 and lambda 2? Uh, in principle, yeah, because I can write only one of them, but they're kind of of the same order. Okay. Uh, there was this thing very important that is not excluded by other experiments, okay, that obviously we thought about. This is for power gravity, right? Mm, uh, uh, it will not be, yeah, but no. th this is so far a particular example of for gravity. Uh, but yeah, so naively there are many terms, okay? So th this, uh, these are just first things you can try to write. Uh, but uh, these things, okay, so in fact, the field theory we have this simplification that we actually do not need to consider operators that vanish on the previous order case of motion, okay? And the leading order, because we talk about black holes for a moment, we're in the vacuum, and so these things, these things vanish. Uh, and uh, the first term that we can write that does not vanish in the case of motion is this uh, Arminura sigma square. Okay, uh, but turns out that again, even this thing is in uh, four dimensions the total derivative, so it turns out there is no quadratic term. Okay, uh, and yeah, so a question about f of r gravity is from my point, from, uh, from in this framework, f of r gravity uh, is a completely trivial thing because uh, it all vanishes on Shell and Field Define in a way. Okay, and yeah. maybe produces some new scale degree of freedom, but that's not the answer though. Uh, yes, for Newton star you will get some matter matter interactions. Okay, so if you if I had uh, some T mu nu on the right hand side, then indeed after the field definition I would produce some operators like T squared, and that would be the operators that we would have, we would have seen on the collider a long time ago. Okay, so uh, that's why this is not even in the background of Newton star. This is not a good theory. Okay, good. Okay, let's move to better theory. So next thing is the cubic order. Uh, so let me skip this. Sasha knows everything about this, this cubic operators, but basically we can consider them, but theoretically they're on somewhat, somewhat shaky ground. Uh, and the theory is that we're actually going to consider uh, the build out of operators that are quartic in the Riemann terms. Okay, so the claim is that this is actually the leading term that in four dimensions uh, uh, theoretically you are, you are allowed to consider. Okay. So this, uh, it turns out that there are just three, op in four dimensions, there are three, o three independent operators. So the build of each of the C's is quadratic in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Riemann terms, okay? Uh, and and there, are, there, are, there are just three operators. So this is, this is the theory that, that I'm going to consider, okay? So uh, in principle, we should look at some structure of high derivative terms and uh, Okay, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit like, we, we check that this theory is self-consistent, that there are radiatively, uh, something called radiative stability, which is like the only point where, uh, where quantum, mechanic, uh, quantum mechanics uh, plays a role. This, this whole st story is fully classical. It's important to understand. Uh, and it turns out that these uh, uh, higher order operators do not matter, but the cutoff, they do not matter if this Lambdas, which again, I, I put them different, but think of them as, you know, just can be slightly different, or can be only one of them is, uh, is important, right? Just for notation, all of them, if they matter, all of them are of the order of uh, Schwarzschild radius inverse, okay? Uh, it turns out that this should actually be the cutoff of your thing. So you need to have new states appearing at this scale and somehow unitarizing those operators, okay? And this is important for this uh, question that uh, that, that Andy is asking that, well, how come either at LHC we've, we've probed, okay, not gravity directly, but we've probed the interactions up to much shorter scales. In our everyday life, we definitely probe gravity at the kilometer scales, and it, we, don't, we do not see any modification. So what am I talking about? Why I wrote some operators, suppress them by, uh, by a kilometer scale. Moreover, I said there is some new physics that must come in at this kilometer scale and resolve those operators. Why am I talking about this? Uh, and this is where, indeed, another assumption uh, about this uh, theories comes in. So this is an assumption, but I don't think it is a crazy assumption. At least, uh, again, here philosophy, but I do not obviously see that it is wrong, right? And then it is good enough. So if we can show that that's wrong, then okay, we'll forget about it. But so far, nobody showed uh, uh, that that is impossible. And that we need to assume that this 
you be completion of the series so. So that if energy is bigger than lambda, those operators get unitarized by something and stop growing with energy. So this is something that we uh, that we saw in uh, particle physics many times, of course, right? This is how W boson unitarizes for Fermi interaction. This is how uh, the Higgs boson unitarizes W boson uh, scattering. There was a huge signal at the scale at which at which the Higgs signal at which the Higgs Absolute, boson yeah. unitarizes. And there's no huge signal at this. No, there, there is. This is the signal that is uh, we're going to see at LIGO. Okay, this is where I'm going. Uh, uh, but same. we already saw LIGO, right? There's Good. So we've put some bounds. But this is the first <laughs> bounds. This the, fir the claim is the first bounds. No, what about the, PRS? The, like, let me make what it. What about PSR 1913? We I'll use get, strong field gravity there. I'll get there. I'll get there. But let me make a bold claim, and then I'll, uh, I'll motivate it better for you. <laughs> the bold claim is that... The best limits on all these three numbers so far are like 100 kilometer inverse, and they were put a year and a half ago. No. Okay? When yes. Was, no, when no. the universe horizon was this size, we see we see the cosmic microwave background. Good. At BBM, at the, good, very good point, very good point. Competitive, potentially competitive bound comes from BBM, because I think BBM is the only place where precisely no cosmology, right. the earliest place where precisely right. no cosmology. At BBN, the Hubble scale, which is the curvature scale, was something like thousand times, thousand kilometer, the, ten to the five kilometers, or something. The, I mean, there was a huge industry with hundreds of papers on this twenty years ago okay. about what kind of modifications you could have to gravity. What they scanned all the parameter space, and it was found that there was this whole it's sub millimeter that you could have corrections to gravity in the sub millimeter yes. range. And various tests were done, and this with bound was pushed down further. No, no. Are, are you telling us that there's some other huge hole in the parameter yes, space? Yes, absolutely. That people, That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm you've saying. Scanned, you've scanned the experimental absolutely. data? Absolutely. I've scanned very carefully uh, those experiments. I, let, 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 uh, let me get to the next slide. I mean, <laughs> I mean we were all shocked 20 years ago. We were all shocked 20 years ago when there was a hole in the sub-millimeter range in the experimental data that, that, that gravity could be modified on the yeah. submedium. I mean, this it. thing has been reported to Savas uh, like hundred times, right? And, uh, <laughs> and what does Savas have? He thinks it's funny. But that is, uh, I mean, he, he, he agrees. No, he was surprised. Look, I, I'm actually, I'm a little bit surprised you are so surprised because Savas was surprised, but... Uh, well, maybe I trust Savas more than he trusts himself. <laughs> but, but you, as long as you trust Savas, more than more than me, this uh, this does not offend me. Uh, just at all, but, but yes. your sentence about BBM. I, 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 yes, it. yes. The sentence so about BBM. BBM, so BBM puts a bound on this thing, which is like three orders of magnitude weak, weaker than what like. What's right? What is BBM? Big Bang nucleus. Uh, sorry, Big Bang. So the universe size, the horizon of the universe, was comparable to the space he's talking about back then. And if there was a deviation from gravity, you would see it in the light element abundances. That was my question. There are a hundred different places you well, have to look. Let's not no, talk no, about a hundred. Let's talk yeah, about this one. Very, so I'm asking very something important. specific. Yes. I want an answer. Specific. Let's specific. 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 I give you an answer. The yeah. Hubble scale of BBN was bigger than uh, whatever. Hubble radius of BBN was larger than 100 kilometers, right? Okay. It was like 10,000 kilometers or something. Okay, but you get that But we yeah. checked it and uh, okay. And it's okay? Yes, it's okay. It's okay. What about GPS? Yes, getting that. Uh, okay, I did it. So, so BBM is safe. We can look in the paper more carefully. We have a precise bound. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I can't, I didn't I cannot put anything uh, on the site. Okay. So and look at this slide. Okay. This is my. So I canonically. So I, we're talking about experiments done around flat space, right? So it's good to do expansion around Minkowski. So we'll canonically normalize the metric, right? So G mu nu is eta mu nu plus canonically normalized divided by m. Well, there are, all, there are strong field tests of gravity pre LIGO, right? So, yeah, let's let's first discuss things that you asked about the the sub millimeter test. Uh, let's go through this thing first, okay? One, one step at a time. One one step, one good thing at a time, okay? So we, I take my operator and I estimate uh, uh, what it is. And I go to energies above lambda, and then I said there's this uh, UV softness assumption, so this operator gets unitarized. So all derivatives above lambda, so this thing stops growing at energies above lambda. So we replace it with one, okay? And what we get with, we get the h squared over m Planck squared, 
okay, which is uh, the the value, absolute value of canonical normal graviton fields in Planck units, okay, and this is this uh, actually uh, it's called this post-Newtonian parameter v, which is roughly speaking the measure of how relativistic your object is, okay, and it, and it goes to the fourth power, and basically the statement is that for everything you do in the lab. This v is tiny, some ten to the minus twenty, or I do not know, because because it is take your say your uh, molecule for which you're doing the, the short distance test experiment, right, and compare its radius to its Schwarzschild radius, right? It's something ridiculously small, and then you take this thing to the fourth power. So this is why all those lab experiments are important. So there is another maybe particle physicist way of explaining it that because this operator starts with four graviton legs. You can only probe it with two graviton exchanges, while all we do in the lab is a single graviton exchange. And gravitons are very expensive in the lab because you pay an M Planck for producing every graviton. The only place where gravitons are really cheap is the black hole horizon, the because curve, when you have curvature, where this V is of order one, which which is having a curvature, you know, being close, as the name. Being cosmology satisfies it, right? But cosmology is. Okay, now to pulsars. Sorry, I, I, I did not I did not put a slide on the pulsars, but we check pulsars very carefully. They also give a comparable bound. So let's say, uh, you see, my uh, my thing gets more stronger bound the smaller the black hole is because the Schwarzschild radius gets smaller. So pulsar, uh, the this precision measurements of pulsars puts bound comparable, you know, to thousand kilometer size black hole or something. I mean, it is in the paper. We can look, but but it, it's this. Uh, Serious concern, it is comparable bound, but it is weaker. Okay. So, have you translated this into what the change in the PPN parameters would be that uh, Will likes to study? Eventually, yes, yes. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you in a second, yes. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, so, we're not, we're not ruled out. I, it's important that we believe that it's not ruled out. I was a little bit surprised that uh, usually people buy it faster, but. <laughs> but you're good, you're good audience, you're good audience, okay. Uh, yes, so, okay, so I have, how much time do I really have? I have three minutes by my own calculations. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll verify it. Look, uh, let me just say that we also did some calculations and, and get to this answer, that, that how it's compared to, to post newtonic calculations. So, so there are a few phases, there is in spiral and merger first. Merger is something which you can do analytically. Oh, sorry, merger is something you can only do numerically, this means I cannot do it all. So this phase where black holes are somewhat far away from each other, this is in spiral phase, that's where post-Newtonian perturbation theory works, okay? This is where I can calculate. So, uh, so there is technique by Goldberg and Russian. So I, I, I'm going to flash some formulas very fast. It's going to be impossible to understand them, but maybe we get some existential uh, kind of understanding. I'll just show the results, okay? Uh, so you calculate some Feynman diagrams or classical. This is the type of expressions that you encounter in these calculations. Sometimes may seem. And wh so, what type of observables did we calculate? Okay. So first, there is correction to effective uh, quadruple and current quadruple moment of this binary system. Okay. So how? So, so you know that uh, radiation is like uh, the second de time derivative of a quadruple moment, right? That's the leading. Uh, the, there's formula there from long origin. So usually, so this quad uh, for two point particles. Uh, so the same thing is this post-Newtonian regime, the linear approximation of two black holes, like two point particles orbiting each other, okay? Uh, so this is the standard thing. So usually this is kind of current, uh, sorry, the quadrupole moment is something like this. Here there is a correction to this quadrupole moment that's suppressed by this uh, R is the distance between black holes, okay? So this lambda R, this is one my perturb one parameter in which I'm explaining, okay? This should be smaller than one. And then this is the uh, post-Newtonian expansion. This is roughly speaking, this thing is V to the force. Okay, and then there is, there is some funny effect. There is a current quadrupole, which is like magnetic dipole, analog of magnetic dipole uh, for the thing. And because I had some parity old operator, for example, I get like a mixture between quadrupole and current quadrupole. So they're all kind of, all kind of funny effects you can get. Sorry. Uh, yes. This is, uh, my no, 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 no. Uh, and I, and I, I, am, I am finished. So, oh, let me just say. So the another thing is correction to potential between black. And this is the most. This is phenomenologically the most important, okay? And let's just zoom in on the simplest and the leading effect that we have and, and discuss it a little bit, okay? Because there's some complicated formula. This formula is relatively simple. So this thing, that I took only one of my three operators for simplicity, okay, conceptually all the same, uh, 
uh, and calculated correction uh, to the frequency of emitted radiation divided by the leading Newtonian thing, okay? And so this is what I get. So this is this relatively compact formula. So let's, uh, let's look at it. Uh, there are two independent parameters which I'm doing perturbation theory, okay? This thing, this is like V to the fourth for a circle orbit. This is the usual post-Newtonian uh, expansion, right? And in principle, I can resum. I, 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 if I'm powerful enough, I can calculate corrections in, uh, in, uh, in the powers of V to this thing. There is no new physics in it, right? This is, this is my new parameter uh, that, that contains the scale lambda, okay? And you see that it comes and it's high power. So I'm only, from what I wrote, so this operator is the only thing that affects 1 over lambda r to the 16th. To, to calculate the next 1 over lambda r to the 8th, for example, I need to add new operators. So that is not universal anymore, okay? This is something I do not know. This becomes model dependent. But this, the leading piece, uh, is very universal. Well, there are just three of those, and there's only one that actually comes in at 2p and order, okay? So this is the claim. So from any, it's a rather strong, strong claim from this. Something that has chances uh, not to be ruled out by the experiments is based on these uh, principles like locality and causality. This is the leading correction. Well, very important, it doesn't have other light degrees of freedom, but those can be interpreted. This is the leading correction that we can get to, li to LIGO waveforms, okay? And let me just compare it to uh, what, what Andy asked. What, what does a LIGO paper do? Uh, they say, okay, let's take this omega of C and calculate it to post Newtonian. They calculate it to like order like V to the 7 approximately. Uh, and then there are some coefficients in this expansion that for GR they are unique, they fix. They depend on masses of black holes, they depend on speaks of black hole in particular way. And then they say, well, let's, they call those things arbitrary codes. So CN is equal 1 for GR and uniquely fixed, okay? It's a known function. They say, let's take the CNs and just vary them. Okay, and uh, instead, what I am doing, okay, I'm saying that if, if you want to respect like this physical principle that I mentioned, you are not allowed to vary them in any random way. In fact, there is a very restricted form. You see, very special dependence on. Uh, I don't have like term m1 times m2 here, right? It's specific dependence on masses. If I have, if we go to high order, look at my other form, I have very special dependence on spins on black holes and all the parameters of the merger, okay? This is all fixed, and there is only two leading orders, these three independent coefficients that are lambda, or the lambda tilde minus, lambda minus, okay? And so now, it, and, and you can see that, okay, the effect is small, right? And we will get some statistics for it, but in order to capture this effect with this uh, simple, uh, as with post-Newtonian, this phenomenological post-Newtonian approach of varying post-Newtonian coefficients, we will need to write some arbitrary functions here because we, want to be able to, we don't want to miss it, so we need to generalize function. But then there is like 20 parameters that you randomly vary because this is in a force post-Newtonian or in masses, spins, blah, blah, there is like 20 parameters, but I have one. So of course, statistical significance of discovery, if you understand, if you, uh, go randomly look at 20 parameters, and if you go over one parameter, this is much better. So, so, so this is uh, why we're uh, somewhat happy about, uh, about what we've done. And, uh, yeah, uh, okay, there is, uh, we have some pictures, but uh, I guess I'm running out of time. Uh, but well, just... What's your limit, then? You didn't give us the limit. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, uh, so as I said, the limit that, um, uh, okay, so I'm a theorist, okay. So to me, when I calculated this, this frequency thing, I was it's probably as much as I can do. To actually set uh, actual limit, you, you need to do some extra more work. But first of all, you need to calculate post-Newtonian, well, at least understand post-Newtonian calculations up to this order, then put it into some, uh, do some Fisher matrix analysis. Uh, and this is some work in progress, uh, but we have some actual uh, professionals that are helping us, uh, Buanana, Alessandra Buananos mm -hmm. group, uh, I think they got interest in that are helping us with it because that's not something I can. Uh, my limit is 100 kilometers because, it, you know, 100 kilometers. Well, you've got like London to the six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, of, of course, of course, yeah. But more careful analysis uh, okay. is, is required and, and, it, and it is going underway. But is this the same just looking at the time for merger? Because it's very much simpler. 
Well, okay. So uh, there is there is something. So I let me. I'm in, I'm in I'm in this because there are already questions, right? So very uh, relieved. <coughs> Uh, but uh, uh, so I'm in this regime where the uh, my one of for post Newtonian calculations to actually be be efficient uh, to give sizable corrections I need to be in the regime where my black hole is somewhat smaller than my kind of new physics scale. Okay, so this way uh, when black holes are kind of far away and perturbation theory in this thing works uh, um, the uh, still post-Newtonian regime is still applicable, right? So they're kind of, kind of far away. Uh, and okay, uh, now, uh, in this regime I cannot really tell you what happens at the merger itself, because when the merger happens, it's out of my, I need to know UV completion, right? And, but it's not clear that something terrible happens, okay? That we saw that, that black holes actually, I don't think black holes will not merge. Okay, there are some new particles, roughly speaking, coming in doing something, uh, but, but this is something I cannot predict. But to put the most stringent bounds of lambda, okay? Of course, I want I want to have something like this. I want the black holes for which lambda is within the horizon, so I can trust my perturbation theory all the way to the merger when v becomes a further one. So I'm not surprised by this v to the four. But this to do this, you need to do uh, numerical simulations of the following thing of this terrible equation that comes out from the from the actions so that uh, discuss usually numerical relativity uh, people say that this is important this is completely impossible that this is uh, uh, insane because those operators are this high derivative equations okay you should mention it to Franz Pecoris maybe we discussed uh, Franz actually uh, liked it so he didn't say that he will immediately go and calculate it and similar we will talk to Franz to Louis Lenner yeah, yeah. yeah yeah there were there is also a group at Caltech uh, 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 Leo Stein uh, uh, and, and collaborators uh, that they're doing something similar for uh, something called dynamical gauss bonnet theory. Uh, dynamical Chern Simons and dynamical gauss bonnet It's when you couple a scalar to R tilde or you couple a scale to R squared. And they use this effective EFT lo uh, logic uh, to do this. So, anyways, so the point, the main point, the, the, just the last point, is that you don't need to solve this equation exactly. You only need the leading order correction from the stable mesh. So, so you do first simulate your your merger, then you plug in the metric into this right hand side as a source, and you only do it one. Okay, maybe you need to iterate to get secular effect, but conceptually you do it once, because it's only to leading order in one of the lambda six. Uh, Really care about it. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, this, I've, I've, already, I've already concluded, so care about it. So I, I have a question. We're in the question part, part right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're okay. in the question part. Let's just go right into the question part. So is, is LIGO going to shed, you know, is LISA going to shed any light on this? Because it seems like that's a totally different size scale. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I said, for us, the smallest black holes put the strongest constraints. Yeah, so those are super massive black holes for LISA, right? So they're not going to. No, Pretty yeah, this, so I think Lisa black holes, they kind of have uh, already Schwarzschild radius comparable to Hubble scale during BBM. They're already in that thing, and, and, and probably much, they would not bigger. expect to see it. Yeah, they're bigger, right? Yeah, so this is worse for us. The smaller black holes are better for us because curvature, you see, the length scale goes down, energy scale goes up. So what I would call curvature scale goes up. So all my, uh, all my uh, equations, you see they have one over lambda r. So the larger you take r, okay, r is the distance between black holes, but cannot obviously be smaller than the Schwarzschild radius uh, of the black holes in question, and comparable to it in the case of interest. So uh, when you take, so, so this lambda is some parameter of nature. I'm asking our question, okay, how, uh, how small this lambda can be, how small the energy scale of new physics can be, right? And, well, experiment that probes it, it's uh, the most efficient experiment will operate at highest energies, right? Meaning at sh shortest distances, at shortest Schwarzschild uh, radii. Uh, so I, I, I think LIGA uh, and, okay, maybe future observatories that work in the, uh, that focus on the smallest possible black hole. So ideally we would need something that 
goes to higher frequencies, that LIGA, I would say, that can say, see a merger of, uh, two, of yeah. two, sol I mean, I know, two solar mass black holes. Uh, well, uh, well, if they exist, <laughs> if they exist, but... Uh, but, but, but you also need, I mean, I mean, I missed this before, but are you comparing the Shapiro delay for gravitational waves and E&M, so do you also need advances in E&M observations? Well, sorry, I'm not, uh, yeah, the, the, this, this slide on, uh, sh I'm sorry, that was confusing, the, the, this, this slide on Shapiro time delay and uh, this comparison of Shapiro time delay just I added yesterday because I was excited uh, uh, about uh, uh, neutron star mergers. Uh, this is this is not something I, I based my talk on. It was just kind of another example of type of new physics that you can possibly see. Mm -hmm. With uh, I don't want to see that I'm the, the, the you know the the only one who ever proposed some <laughs> new physics uh, that gravitational observers can see, right? So, so, so the, there is that other proposal. I wanted to say just my personal remark was that within 15 minutes I couldn't come up with uh, uh, some. Uh, uh, more, more what we would call a theory. You see some Lagrangian, let's put it this way, that will deliver uh, this time difference in photons and gravity. Maybe I'm not creative enough, but something that that I will be confident that is not excluded by other experiments. What about mass? If you give the graviton a mass, or, or the photon a mass. Well, if you give me a theory where graviton has a mass and uh, uh, and that works, uh, then uh, okay. I will be already happy even without. Uh, 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 okay, uh, this is recorded by the way. I should. I should be. I should be careful. I think you will be around, right? Uh, I'll, I'll be around. Yeah. yeah no, so I'll, I'll if you have yeah. other questions for Victor, just feel free to ask. And thanks. Thank you. <laughs> And there's pizza today, right? Is it? Right. Yeah. Okay. At four thirty. It's a good sign when you give your. I don't do breakfast tomorrow.